This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about the U.S. stock market and real estate bubbles, what really is the end game for this. But before we do this, I want to rewind and talk a little bit more about yesterday's video in the context, which is going to help us understand where these bubbles came from and where they are headed. So yesterday's video was about how Bitcoin will make the housing market more affordable again by taking out the monetary premium that's embedded in real estate in most countries with a central bank, which is almost all countries at this point. And I mentioned the fact that Paul Krugman was in part responsible for giving this idea to the Fed of inflating the housing bubble in the mid 2000s. So Cashfinger asked in the comment section, can you link to any articles or evidence supporting your claim that the Fed took Krugman up on his idea to create a housing bubble. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul Krugman is an economist who's fairly well known. He writes for the New York Times and he used to be at Princeton. I believe he's currently at the City University of New York. He's a brilliant Keynesian ec economist. He's someone who understands that all prosperity and human flourishing comes from large government spending and central bank money printing rather than from stupid things like free markets and technological innovation. And he's also famous for having rightly called out scammy projects like the internet. In 1998, Paul Krugman shared his thoughts about the future of the internet. The growth of the internet, this is a quote from Krugman himself, the growth of the internet will slow drastically. Most people have nothing to say to each other. And we know this, in fact, because there is no such thing as social media and people talking to each other online. By 2005, it will become clear that the internet's impact on the economy has been no greater than the fax machine. So you should know this when you're talking about Paul Krugman. He also has been a long time critic of Bitcoin, calling it evil, calling it a bubble, being very happy in 2018 when it popped and saying that it was going to zero. And he's been wrong. He's been wrong again and again and again. This is a pretty article, a pretty funny article about how it's so hard for Krugman and people like him, like Peter Schiff, to admit that they're wrong uh, after having been wrong for so many years. So this is the dangers of, of uh, cognitive biases. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit the like and subscribe buttons and leave a comment if possible to help to support the channel. So how does all this discussion about Paul Krugman relate to the horrendous housing bubble that we experienced in the US in the mid 2000s? Well, here's the brief history to give you context for that. And it's really a history of government and central banker extreme incompetence. So in the late 1990s, Alan Greenspan kept interest rates too low for too long. He caused a stock market bubble. And then he finally caught on by the late 90s. He started raising interest rates, 99 to 2000. He ended up popping the stock market and causing a recession and a very, very deep bear market, which was very hard on the economy. By the early 2000s, Greenspan decided to keep interest rates too low for too long again in order to ignite the U.S. housing bubble, as we're going to see at Krugman's advice. 2004 to 2006, Greenspan and then his successor at the Fed, Ben Bernanke, raised interest rates and popped the U.S. housing bubble. Popping the U.S. housing bubble nearly took down the entire U.S. banking system. We can see the competence of these central bankers. 2009, Bernanke started money printing, quantitative easing to bail out the banking system. But in the process, he ended up destroying the Fed's balance sheet. It's never really recovered from this. It's never gone back to pre-2008, 2009 levels. And this enabled the U.S. government to really gorge on debt. So we have this context. U.S. stock market bubble led to housing bubble, led to another stock market bubble of the 2010s, as well as a U.S. treasury bubble and U.S. dollar bubble. And all this money printing ended up really hurting U.S. purchasing power. And that's why things are a lot more expensive than they were in 2010. Now, the thing about interest rates, especially interest rates on U.S. treasuries, they can only be maintained at low levels, meaning below, let's call it 20% or 15% at this point through Fed money printing and buying bonds. And this money printing conjures up a lot of new U.S. dollars into existence. It lowers the purchasing power of U.S. dollars in your pocket and in your bank account. So it's a very, very evil thing. It contributes largely as well to wealth inequality because wealthy people know are better at uh, hedging and have the means to hedge against this by buying a portfolio of stocks, possibly Bitcoin as well, and real estate. So monetary and fiscal policy since 1971, when the U.S. officially went off the gold standard and ended the convertibility of the U.S. dollar into gold, and especially since 2002 in the wake of the dot-com bubble and greater U.S. stock market bubble imploding, has been one policy, which is called kicking the can down the road. And one of the people really responsible for this, of course, is Paul Krugman. Here's the Krugman editorial that I was referring to in yesterday's video. This dates from August 2nd. 
2002, really towards the end of that terrible, terrible bear market, which I remember very well. I think the uh, stock market bottomed, ended up bottoming in October of 2002, so it's just a few months away. W's double dip is referring to the possibility of a second recession. W, of course, is George W. Bush. This is obviously behind a payroll at the, paywall at the New York Times, but if you want to view part of it, there's an excerpt here that I am uh, I'm excerpting the, the relevant piece, and this is Krugman. This is from that editorial. To fight this recession, the Fed needs more than a snapback. It needs soaring household spending. And notice how top-down this is. Notice the arrogance of these people. They think they can manage a huge economy with so many moving parts from the top down. It needs a soaring household spending, a soaring household spending to offset moribund business investment. And to do that, as Paul McCulley of PIMCO put it, and we should also blame Paul McCulley, this really is the double Pauls in this case, we should blame Paul McCulley of PIMCO as well. Alan Greenspan, again, this is this is uh, Paul, Paul Krugman citing Paul McCulley and agreeing with him. Alan Greenspan needs to create a housing bubble to replace the NASDAQ bubble. This is how this is how fiat economists think, and this was disastrous, and this hurt so many, so many people. The thing about Krugman is he's just another fiat idiot who has a long history of being wrong about everything. He was wrong about the internet. He's been wrong about Bitcoin, and the thing is about these people, they never suffer any personal or career consequences, even though they're wrong again and again and again. And this is because they're megaphones for central bankers for the existing fiat system and for Keynesian politicians. Our government and our institutions at this point are full of people like this, and I'm hopeful that a Bitcoin standard will eventually flush these people out. We have Janet Yellen in 2017 saying she expects no new financial crisis in our lifetimes. And just three years later, of course, we had the 2020 uh, stock market crash and financial crisis. We have Powell getting it completely wrong about inflation, running from one side of the boat to the other, calling inflation transitory, uh, be ending up uh, attacking it too late. And then now he's raised interest rates too much. There's just incompetence at every end. So what is the end game of this series of rolling bubbles that we've seen? And it really was a, a series of rolling bubbles that went from the stock market to the housing market, to the US Treasury market, and the sovereign debt market. So we now have a sovereign debt bubble. And how are we going to get out of this is the question. The problem is when you follow people like Paul Krugman and you kick the can, can down the road for as long as we have, you end up having no good choices. So for example, when Paul Volcker was raising interest rates in the late 70s, early 80s, US debt to GDP was around 30, 31%, and it's now above 120%. So there are no good choices once you let public debt as a percentage of GDP get so large. And there's obviously a lot of municipal and state and personal and household and corporate debt as well, which is not captured in this chart. But you really have no good choices at this point. What The only real way out of this is lots lots more Fed money printing, followed by intermittent periods of tough talk like we're in now where the Fed says they're going to really shrink their balance sheet and they're going to hike interest rates as high as they need to. They, they actually can't do this without blowing up the U.S. government and making it uh, making the U.S. government unable to, to fund itself. So you'll have these intermittent periods of tough talk followed by more and more Fed money printing, as I think we'll see in the coming in the coming months. Here's the real problem, and you've got to keep your eye on the big picture. We have public debt, which is all the US treasuries, which is at something like 31 trillion. But you want to be looking at is US unfunded liabilities. I'm here on usdebtclock.org. US unfunded liabilities, 181, call it 182 trillion. And by contrast, US GDP is something like, just off the top of my head, 22 trillion. So we're very, very far away from that. If you take a look at the Fed's balance sheet, Fed's balance sheet currently just over Eight trillion, and so you have this this um, disparity between unfunded liabilities and the base money that's on the Fed's balance sheet. And these two are going to need to converge, and the way they converge is by the Fed printing a lot more money and buying these treasuries. The Fed will eventually need to print enough money over time to buy most of the U.S. Treasuries in existence, as well as future U.S. Treasuries that are going to have to be issued to fund these U.S. currently unfunded liabilities like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And that's an enormous amount of new US dollars that will need to be printed. Now, whenever I make statements like this, there's, I'm usually accused of some sort of baseless fear mongering, saying that something like this can't happen. But the good thing about this is that this is no longer just a thought experiment. We are seeing it play out in Japan as we speak, 
where the Bank of Japan, which is Japan's equivalent of the Fed, it's their central bank, currently owns 63% of all the stock market ETFs. And what's even more, more startling, this article is as of July of 2022, I believe it's higher now, but the Bank of Japan, their, their local central bank, owns half of the JGB market, half of the Japanese government bond market. And they've need, needed to buy all this debt in order to keep yields from exploding higher and bankrupting and destroying the whole Japanese economy. Think about this, a central bank buying up half of the treasury uh, the local treasury market, or the local government bond market. This has happened before, and this is the th same thing that's going to happen in the U.S. at a much larger scale. And that's an enormous amount of new U.S. dollars that are going to need to be printed. This is exactly how all fiat currencies die. This is how they eventually die. They leave the gold standard, and then they inflate. They print themselves into oblivion. And the U.S. dollar is no exception. It's eventually going to happen. It's not going to happen next year or in two years, but we are in a path to massive US dollar devaluation, not just against other fiat currencies, because the US dollar might actually strengthen against other fiat currencies, but we're talking about a devaluation, a loss of purchasing power against goods and services. So maybe the US dollar gets really strong compared to the euro or the yen, but compared to real things like goods and services, the US dollar will continue to lose purchasing power. This is why you need to have Bitcoin, in my opinion. If you missed out on my series on hyperinflation and what happens to the stock market, what happens to the housing market, and what will happen to Bitcoin as well in countries experiencing hyperinflation, be sure to check out these videos from the last couple days, what happens to stocks and real estate in hyperinflation, as well as the worst investment mistake you can make under hyperinflation, which is using any sort of leverage because of the, the huge volatility that comes with central bank missteps. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.